So this is just basically um, to fill you in on a few developments that we've seen <clears throat> and also to explain kind of what goes on after they come for their therapy and how we're going to look after the patients now for the next year. Because before we were kind of, we did our therapy and we said, okay, go home for three months, 90 days, you know, 100 days, it's going to be murder, it's going to be up and down and all over the place. Kind of, I want to say suck it up and get through it. Yeah, it was kind of more of our, my attitude. Uh, and then we kind of looked at them after that time to see what was going on. Yeah. What we didn't realize in the, in the whole equation is that now where we've switched from using blood stem cells to using stromovascular fraction, we have a whole different group of stem cells uh, in action. Yeah? We know with blood stem cells, they're very good at repairing the immune system. So blood stem cells, hematopoic cells, they can only become blood cells. They don't, they don't turn into cartilage or anything like that. They just become blood cells. So that means the, the hematopoietic cells that we're using are very good at repairing the immune system. So if you have any, anything wrong with your immune system, <clears throat> they can become all of the cells that are within the immune system. And we know with Lyme, I'm saying especially five years ago or longer, Lyme was more an autoimmune disease. Patients were presenting with all signs of autoimmunity. That's why it was being misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome and things like that, because they were so autoimmune. And that's where blood stem cell therapy was ideal because we'd give them the blood stem cells, it would alter the immune system, modulate the immune system, and most of their problems would go away. Even things like Lyme, arth uh, Lyme, Lyme arthritis and stuff like that would go away because this was all an autoimmune reaction going in the body. Yeah. But Lyme has shifted and we're seeing the shift and now we're seeing most patients with neurological disease, very strong symptoms of neurological disease going as far as paralysis and neuropathy and things like this. So this is more than just autoimmune. And what we've done, we switched to using stromovascular fraction instead of just blood stem cells. The good thing about stromovascular fraction, it doesn't just have blood stem cells, it has many, many blood stem cells, but it also has mesenchymal stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells can repair the nervous system. So there's many studies showing that when you expose the nerves basically to mesenchymal cells, that you get neuron growth. And this is exactly what we want because we need to repair the damaged nervous system uh, of these patients. Yeah, but neuron growth comes with a price. Yeah, and that's something we didn't really realize at the beginning of this. And that's the trouble when you're kind of the first trying to work things out. Yeah, you, you get these these problems. So what was happening? We did stromovascular fraction. <clears throat> Our patients did really well at the beginning. Yeah, they were, you know the 90 days or 100 days and the first few months. Oh, I'm feeling great. This has changed my life. And then all of a sudden, around six months, there was this. Poof, dip yeah and they were in a horrible state yeah mentally emotional in a horrible state a lot of pain a lot of discomfort all kinds of symptoms mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden all these new things would come up new allergies or intolerances to food or intolerances to exercise and things like that and we kind of put it down to neuro healing saying you know your nerves are just healing and they're overstimulated and things like that but for some of these patients it just didn't stop yeah, and obviously there was something else going on that we had to look at. And this, this is what we've kind of finally worked out what's going on, find out how we can help these patients. Um, and that's why we've changed our program again. <laughs> yeah. So the treatment, it hasn't really changed. But what we're doing now, instead of just saying, you know, go home and write this out and we're here to support you, we're actually actively giving support during these, these 12 months. Yeah. For me, that's a bit of a change because I was always against giving supplements. I think, you know, there's the book, Expensive Urine. When you take too many supplements, it just kind of goes through your body and things like that. And I'm thinking to these patients, their, their whole metabolism is so damaged, giving them all these supplements. Some would come with 60 different supplements. They'd have an Excel sheet of their supplements and when to take what. And they'd come with these bags of pills and, oh, this is my midday pile and this is my, you know. And I'm thinking, how can the body even metabolize all that stuff? So my idea was, you know, get rid of it and just add what you need. But what I'm seeing now, I've got to change that view. And as Lyme's changed, you know, we've got to adapt our program and things like that. And I really do think we need to actively give our patients specific supplements. Yeah, not, not just everything in the kitchen sink, but just very, very specific things. And this is what we've looked into basically to see where do they need help, what is the support they need, and what specific pathways uh, do we need to support. <clears throat> Um, so anyway, yeah, the way the program is now and the, and the home program is, um, oh no, let me, let me just explain what happens then with the patients, yeah. So we've seen a couple of things. First, the main thing is we're seeing with neurohealing, um, 
there's something happened, it's called Wallerian degeneration. Yeah. Wallerian degeneration has been studied in animals, so in rats and, and mice and, and rabbits and things. And basically what Wallerian degeneration means is that if you damage a nerve, there has to go through a certain degenerative process to break down the damage before the nerve can regrow. Yeah. So in experiments, basically they cut through nerves in rabbits and kind of saw how this growth process uh, should happen. So this is something, uh, this area, let's say, um, this area of study is really important because we're looking at how can we help patients that, you know, have broken their back or have that kind of nerve damage and they're paralyzed. Par paralyzed. Can we get their nerves to grow? <clears throat> um, what was interesting is patients that have nerve damage often develop all kinds of intolerances and pain syndromes and things like that. The question is why? Yeah. And this is where Wallerian de degeneration comes in. And what they've seen with Wallerian degeneration is when the body starts to break down the damaged nerves and build up new ones, <clears throat> histamine is needed for this process. Yeah. And histamine is a thing that we know from allergies. So when you have allergies, take an antihistamine to stop that allergic reaction. Yeah? Histamine is really important in the body. Uh, for example, when we cut ourselves uh, and you get that swelling around the cut, that's histamine that's going there. And that's really important because histamine basically pulls lots of liquid to that area and pulls the cells apart. And that way the immune cells can go in between the cells and kind of clean things up. Yeah, it's a very important thing that we have histamine. It can cause some, you know, just some itching and things like that. It's a bit unpleasant, but it's an important part of the healing. <clears throat> but we have certain enzymes in our body to break down the histamine. So after a while, that histamine is in our bloodstream and it circles around. And we have enzymes, especially in our gut, that break down the histamine. So the histamine is produced, it does its thing, and then it's broken down by the body, and it's fine. Um, yeah. We know patients with allergies often have problems with their intestines and with the intestinal flora and things like that, and they've lost, a lot of them have lost the ability to break down histamine. Or patients with histamine intolerance, they've lost the ability to break it down because they've lost their enzymes in, in their gut, basically. And we know patients with histamine intolerance, if we put them on a special diet for a few months, then they can tolerate histamine again because they start to rebuild these, these enzymes. Yeah? <clears throat> so this is something, this is a process that goes on in the body. But then with Wallerian degeneration, what we see is the, the histamine producing cells, these are called mast cells. You have a certain number of these attached to the nerves because they work very closely with the nerves. <clears throat> They've seen that these mast cells multiply by about 10 times. So all of a sudden you have 10 times the amount of mast cells there producing, of course, 10 times the amount of histamine which is fine if you can break down histamine, yeah? I think with those big loads of histamine, you're still gonna have some problems, yeah? But if you can break it down, it doesn't accumulate. But what we're seeing with a lot of our patients, they don't have the ability to break down the histamine. So now all of a sudden, instead of, you know, just one part of histamine, they're getting 10 parts of histamine, so lots and lots of histamine, and they don't have the ability to break it down. <clears throat> so this is accumulating, 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 and that's why they're going into all these histamine problems, yeah? Uh, histamine problems from just swelling, weight gain, edema, itching, feeling awful. Anytime they eat, their belly swells and they just don't know. And then suddenly they can't eat anything and they you know, just don't do well at all. Exercise just makes them sick because all of this is triggering more and more histamine production. But this is all part of the Wallerian degeneration that we need for neurohealing. So it seems once the Wallerian degeneration has started, it's going to continue. Yeah? So we had to find a way, how can we help the patients break down um, the system in? So that's one of the changes that we made in, in the home program. So you notice now, right at the beginning, the patients come for their SVF, they go home, the first thing with the home program is gut issues, digestive issues. Yeah? So we're giving them a 30 strain probiotic, for example, because we want to change the intestinal flora. Yeah? The reason we chose a 30 strain or more it's just simply some bacteria that you find in probiotics actually produce histamine. Yeah, so if they're not doing well with histamine and then you give them a probiotic, they actually do worse because of the histamine production of the bacteria we give. If we have a wide range of bacteria that we give to the, the patients, <clears throat> we find that some of these bacteria actually break down the histamine that other bacteria are producing. So patients can often tolerate a probiotic that has 30 plus strains much better than they can tolerate a probiotic that just has 10 strains, you know, because it, it balances out the histamine. <clears throat> so this is one thing, a 30 strain plus um, probiotic. And we did, we did recommend one uh, in the US. We have to look, see for, for Europe and things like that. 
we will actually be producing one ourselves uh, very soon. So we have this uh, from Infusio. We know um, this one works and we can give it to the patients. Then uh, we're giving them psyllium seed, Florsam, I think in German, yeah, psyllium seed. <clears throat> the nice thing about psyllium seed, it doesn't really like mop up histamine. Patients are thinking it kind of absorbs all the histamine. It doesn't really do that. But what it does, several things. First of all, it produces a slime that goes through the intestines, yeah. That is a form of fiber, so it will help the intestines to work better. Yeah, a lot of patients, their, their digestion is very sluggish. <clears throat> and at the beginning, it's quite difficult for them to deal with that because now all of a sudden the, the intestines really have to work and the muscles have to get used to working. So that's a training effect that takes a few weeks maybe even to, um, to kick into place. But the slime that's developed um, and goes through the intestines actually has an anti-inflammatory effect. So it's going to help to relieve the inflammation that's in the intestines. <clears throat> And the slime is what we call a prebiotic. So it forms a terrain in which the healthy bacteria can grow. So we're forming that terrain and we're giving the healthy bacteria. So it's helping to repopulate the digestive system with good bacteria, a whole range uh, of good bacteria. Yeah? And it kind of gets things moving um, as well. So doing that, we're giving the, the intestines basically the best possible way of developing the enzymes and everything that we need to break down the histamine. Yeah. Remember, the histamine, the Wallerian degeneration, we're saying that comes kind of six months down the road. So that's why we started day one, preparing the body. So we're preparing the body to be able to break down histamine. We're trying to optimize this. Yeah. We also know that a lot of patients come into the program with histamine problems. Yeah. So right from the start, we're starting to give a histamine scavenger. And there's a difference between an antihistamine and a histamine scavenger. Yeah, because remember, we need the histamine for, for the neurological repair. So if we give an antihistamine and block the histamine production, we're going to have a problem. Yeah? But what we can do is scavenge access, uh, excess histamine that's there. Yeah? And that's what we can do with the scavenger. Now the scavenger's got lots of uh, natural things in it. Here I've got some here. Um, so this is basically the powder um, that we make and, and we can put it into capsules for the patients We do that. There's lots of good things in there. Uh, of course, there's quercetin, the famous quercetin. That's why it's kind of yellowish. Um, but we've also got this aloe vera in there. There's some bitter orange. Um, also put some bromelain in there, which is from pineapples, um, which really helps. In order to facilitate how the quercetin is being uh, absorbed by the body, we added some black pepper. So that's not really a histamine scavenger, but it helps with the absorption uh, of quercetin. There's a little bit of licorice in there, pine bark we put in, which now have lots of anti-inflammatory properties. There's marshmallow root, also lots of anti-inflammatory properties that are in there. And basically with these things, we're making sure that we scavenge the axis histamine, but we're not blocking the H3 receptors, which are on the nerves, mm -hmm. because we want those receptors to be active, because this is where the healing happens. Yeah, We want to block other receptors that are causing kind of edema and all the discomfort and things, we can block those. But the H3 receptors have to stay free. And we know with these things, we can basically scavenge the histamine that's there, but not affect the neurohealing. So this is a better approach to just giving antihistamines. Yeah? So basically, we can start our patients immediately after stromovascular fraction. We can immediately include the histamine scavenger. And at the same time, we're basically changing all the bacteria in their intestines and things like that to enable them to develop the enzymes they need to break down the histamine. So that's kind of the initial part of the home program. Yeah. In addition to that, we're having them drinking a lot of water or tea, which is really important. First of all, when you take psyllium seeds, you need to have a lot of water in your system. If you don't, you'll get constipated. So, you know, two liters of water or, or liquids we're drinking. So we're saying teas, nettle tea is really good or any kind of tea that they can drink to do that. Um, I think we're doing castor oil packs as well. Castor oil packs is just traditional medicine. Um, again, can help with inflammation, can help with digestion, can help the liver just to process things, just kind of a supportive thing. Um, we've included breathing exercises in there as well. The breathing exercises are more <clears throat> to mobilize the intestines because we know if the intestines haven't been working properly, they're in the wrong position. Yeah? The intestines hang like on loops of connective tissue and they can get out of place. And when the intestines get out of place, first of all, it can affect the digestion but it also tugs on the connective tissue. And the connective tissue is full of nerves that are really connected to our autonomic nervous system. So if those nerves have been stimulated, you feel off. I mean, you know how it is when you have a, an upset stomach? It's not just your stomach, you just feel off. You don't feel good, yeah? And that's the autonomic nervous system being stimulated. 
Uh, so through the breathing exercises, we can kind of mobilize, you know, the digestive tract and, and help with that. So that's the idea of the breathing exercises. <clears throat> and then we do have a little kind of meditation or just kind of, what should we call it, self-centering a little bit. So a few exercises to do that just to kind of bring down the, the adrenaline or epinephrine levels and kind of get more into oxytocin, which we know is really, really important for healing. Yeah, So we're bringing those uh, factors in too. So that's the beginning. There's one more thing we added uh, to the beginning thing, and that was SAM-E uh, as, a, as a supplement. Yeah, and I see we have it here. This is uh, SAM-E. Um, some people take SAM-E for depression or if you have kind of low energy and things, you can take it. But there's a reason why we're giving it um, to our patients, and this is where methylation comes in. Yeah. So methylation, uh, we've talked a lot about methylation. We tend to think of methylation as being the detox cycle within the body. So a lot of patients say, you know, I don't methylate. Yeah. And there's videos of me saying, well, if you don't methylate, you'll die, yeah? which is true, because if you can't get rid of toxins, at some point you're just going to poison yourself. So I've always said I've never really been too, too worried about methylation as far as detoxing is concerned. I likened it um, in LA, we have this, um, a very big highway that goes next to LA, it's called the 405, yeah? it's, it's actually the biggest, busiest street in the world, yeah? it's millions and millions of cars uh, go along there, and I say, you know, if you close down the 405, it doesn't mean there's not going to be any cars in LA, they'll just all go a different way, yeah? and when they take different streets, they're going to do damage all along the road that wouldn't have happened before, but there's still going to be cars in LA. And it's the same thing to if you say, oh, my methylation doesn't work. Of course it works somehow, yeah, but it's not working in an ideal pathway, and that means the other pathways that are being activated will cause a different kind of damage in your body than if it was running smoothly, yeah. So I've never really um, worried about that too much. Methylation, if, if you have the famous genes that, that don't work, they're your genes. We're not going to change them. That's how they are, yeah. So you have the choice of saying, okay, I'm condemned to death because my methylation doesn't work, or... You know, we have to find an alternative route for things to work, and how can we support that? So I've never really got too much involved in the methylation part. But there's other parts of methylation um, which I think are important. And this has nothing to do with detoxing or heavy metals and things like that. This has to do with histamine production, glutamate production, and things like that. Um, if I look, I mean, methylation is quite complicated. I'm sure you're familiar with like graphs like this that show kind of the methylation cycle, how it works, yeah. We've got the Krebs cycle, which is basically where the life of the cell is, where the powerhouse of the cell is. And this is kind of processes through methylation, how certain substances are produced. Yeah? So there's actually kind of four main cycles that we see. But we're saying, seeing two things. When this cycle works correctly, at the end here, we see SAM-E is produced. Yeah? So if this cycle is not working correctly, basically the patients aren't getting the end product that we need. And that's why we said, okay, let's give them the end product, SAM-E. Yeah? So this isn't fixing anything, it's just the fact that they're not getting what they need, so let's give it, yeah? So that's, that's the idea of the SAMI. Uh, it sounds very simple, and the simple solution is not a simple solution, yeah? Some patients do not do well if you just give them SAMI, yeah? So this is why we said, mate, with some patients, we've got to kind of gauge it. Do we give them SAMI straight away, or do we first put them on the home program and let's say three, four weeks down the road when kind of the histamine levels are dropping and less inflammation and less kind of stress to the body, do we add the SAMI? So that's where Dr. Bijan and Dr. Kim come in to kind of think, okay, where do we do that? I think it's always worth a try, but our patients are sensitive and we just have to know that, so we have to guide them uh, through, through the thing. Yeah? So SAMI comes in there. But we have another problem too, and a lot of patients have problems kind of in this area of the cycle, like the BHA, for example, the THF. And what happens there, if this isn't working, things drop down and they have a lot of glutamate being produced, yeah? So glutamate, um, we know, there's monosodium glutamate, is probably one word you know with glutamate. But glutamate uh, is very good for our nervous system. But if you have too much of it, it can cause all kinds of problems, yeah? So if their methylation is producing tons and tons of glutamate and not enough SAMe, once you get to this glutamate, first of all, they're going to lack serotonin, they're going to lack dopamine and things because that's kind of jumped over. So these patients have a lot of problems with, I'd say, emotions. I don't want to say the word depression. It's just more emotional. Yes, it's just they don't feel good. Yeah, They're very sensitive to things and just yeah, can't have lack of motivation and things like that. We notice they respond very well to antidepressants. So we, when we give like a yeah, antidepressant or a serotonin 
reuptake inhibitor. That's right, <laughs> yeah. So the serotonin levels start to go up a little bit. They start to feel better. So this was also kind of a fix that we could give them, but it wasn't actually addressing the problem. It was just kind of substituting, again, something that was missing. But anyway, when these patients get lots of glutamate, there's a big problem because, first of all, glutamate makes you very moody. It makes you very emotional. And I think the biggest problem is glutamate does something. It's called hyperalgesia. It, makes, it amplifies pain in your body. So these patients are already in pain. They're getting lots of glutamate, and that pain they have has been amplified. So you felt lousy. Now you feel lousy times 10 yeah, because of all this glutamate being produced. So that's why um, we, we've suggested maybe giving something here that's like a glutamate scavenger that will remove the glutamate or support this cycle that we don't get all this glutamate being produced. Yeah. Some patients don't do too well on that. We have to see. Because if patients have POTS or something like that, the, the contents of the, of the scavenger can lower their blood pressure a little bit. And these patients that have POTS are very sensitive to their blood pressure dropping. Yeah, so you have to, again, it's kind of a, a balance uh, to see uh, if, they, if they can deal with that. But those are the two things, so the, the SAM-E and then the glutamate uh, to support this, this cycle, basically. When we're doing that, then we don't need the, the anti, um, antidepressant anymore because the serotonin is preserved. Uh, but we just have to make sure that blood pressure is supported yeah. in those patients if they're, if they're a little bit sensitive. Yeah? So that's the first step of our home program. So basically with that, we are supporting the production of the enzymes in the intestine so they can break down histamine, so we're preparing them. Yeah, We're also scavenging some of the histamine that's there, especially if they have histamine problems. Um, we're giving them the end product of the methylation that this may be not working, so we're giving them SAM-E, and then we're helping with the overproduction of glutamate to remove that. Yeah. And with that, we found that a large amount of the patients f simply feel better. The stress of the disease kind of is lessened. Yeah? Heads clearer, more energy. It doesn't mean they're magically better, but they feel so much better yeah? <laughs> just through that. Yeah? So we can get that at the beginning. So once we've done that, we know the cycle then is after four months, they come back for ACT. Yeah? Why do we place ACT at the four-month mark? Well... What we've seen when we give stromovascular fraction, we always spoke about the 100 days afterwards, yeah? The 100 days is just simply because when we give the cells, first of all, there's hematopoic cells in there. The hematopoic stem cells, um, they multiply by about 10 generations, yeah? And each generation takes about 10 days to form. So we know the cells that we give you, after about 100 days, those cells, the direct impact of those cells is, is gone, yeah? So now we have all new cell lines that are built from those cells. So that's why we had that kind of 100-day period. So it's three or four months, yeah. We also know that stromovascular fraction has lots of growth factors and lots of kind of healing factors and things like that in it. And this is why the patients went through a very adaptive stage during that beginning, because all kinds of things were going on in the body. But we noticed that about four months, that's when it kind of calmed down. Then we had a little bit of a lull, and then all the neurological problems started. Let's say the neurological repair started, which caused symptoms. So kind of in that point where there's the lull just before the neurological repair starts, that's when we give the ACT. Yeah. The reason for doing it there is ACT contains lots of immune cells. So you have to remember, before therapy, patients had a damaged immune system. So with their damaged immune system, the ratios of the immune cells were not correct, and that's why they were not having a coordinated immune response. But now through the stromovascular fraction and the, and the treatment they've had, we've kind of sorted out that problem. Yeah, so now is the time, once that's sorted out, now's the time to give an immune therapy to utilize the immune system that's now fixed to utilize it to do what it should do. Yeah, and so that's why we're giving the ACT at that point. Yeah. The ACT contains lots of cells that actually have the right, let's say, immune imprint of the patient. Yeah, it's almost like a vaccine that we're producing that's individual to the patient. Because remember with Lyme, when a tick bites you, it doesn't necessarily only give you Borrelia. It might not even give you Borrelia, but it's giving you a whole range of bacteria and viruses and things. Yeah. So each tick bite is like an individual fingerprint for each patient. So I can't say your Lyme's the same as yours and yours is not the same as yours. It doesn't work like that. It's a very individual thing. So what we're producing is all of that information is in the patient, yeah, and their immune system has reacted to it already. So the immune systems, are, the immune cells are sensitized to it. So we can take those immune cells, and that's what we do with the ACT. We're taking them, 
And just through the production, the way we treat, we, there's lots of growth factors and they're now becoming activated. So it's like we've taken those soldiers that have basically been trained and now we're giving them back as an army to go in and, and do what they need to do. Yeah. And then the ACT again contains some stem cells, there's some hematopoietic stem cells in there, mesenchymal stem cells. So it gives them a little stem cell boost as well. But the main thing is this immune stimulant that we want now. Because the immune system's now been fixed, now we kind of activate it and use it. And that's what we do at that point. Right? So that's why we give the ACT there. At that point, we also want to start something else. Uh, and that is um, a support. Um, many Lyme patients, interesting, Dr. Klinghart wrote about this too. There's something called KPU or cryptopyrolourea, yeah, um, that probably up to 80% of Lyme patients have. Yeah. What this basically means is that the patients cannot retain zinc and B6. Yeah, so they lose this. Yeah, You can do tests. You can do a urine test and you see there's certain things that you can measure in the urine to see if someone has KPU. Yeah. The downside of the test is to do the test, you need to collect urine over 24 hours. You need to keep it protected from light. You need to keep it at a stable temperature. And then once you've collected it, you need to get it to the lab in those same conditions. Uh, otherwise, the particles that they're testing for just disintegrate in the urine. Even shaking it about, the particles can disintegrate. So I tell you, the test is a little bit sensitive and very inaccurate. Uh, if you're going to do it at home and then send your urine in, even sending it in can break it all down and then the test come back negative, even though it's positive. So it's a very difficult test to perform. But when performed correctly, you can see if someone has what we call KPU or not, yeah? which means they're losing a lot of zinc and things like that. The trouble with losing zinc is then the body f tries to compensate for the zinc and it will capture heavy metals, so typically copper. Yeah? So we're hearing from a lot of patients, yeah, my copper levels are high. Yeah? So we're thinking, oh, do you have Wilson? You know, and they check, no, they don't have Wilson's because the serum plasma is low, but their copper is high. Yeah? And this is often a sign of KPU as well. So the body is not collecting zinc, but instead of zinc, it's taking copper and it can take other heavy metals too. So when we hear our, our patients complaining about their heavy metals, yeah, it's not necessarily that their methylation is not working properly and they're not detoxing. It can very well be that they have KPU and they don't have enough zinc, so the body's taking these and, and keeping these metals uh, in the cell. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so what we're doing at that point is giving what we call KPU support. Yeah. So we're giving a supplement uh, that contains zinc, it contains manganese, magnesium, and two types of B6. Yeah. So there's the pyridoxal 5-phosphate that we give, and then the, the other kind, um, the pyridoxin. Uh, B6. So we give those two kinds of B6, magnesium, manganese, zinc, we have that as a supplement. We're not curing the KPU, but we're replacing what's missing in the patient. So we're substituting the zinc. Yeah? Dr. Klingard also has a theory that um, the actual Lyme disease converts the cell into KPU. So we always thought it was just a genetic thing that you have, but it could possibly be acquired so that when you have Lyme disease, because the, basically the bugs, they don't like the zinc either. So if you can get the cell to drop the zinc, it kind of puts them in a better situation. So it could be an acquired thing as well through the disease. So what we're doing is adding the zinc, replacing what's missing. Sounds really good, and patients feel good at the beginning, but remember, the body's taken all these heavy metals in place of the zinc. So once the zinc's there, what's the body going to do? It's going to drop all the heavy metals. So now all of a sudden... We're going to have problems with copper and arsenic and maybe even mercury and things like that. They're going to have all these heavy metal problems again. Yeah. So just going back to the program, we've prepared them with the histamine. So we're giving them all the things to prepare the intestines. Yeah. We're giving support of certain pathways of the methylation cycle. We're giving a histamine scavenger to get rid of the axis histamine. Yeah. We've then given them ACT to activate the now repaired immune system and give a little stem cell boost. We're now giving them support so that they can basically fill up on their zinc and B6 and things like that. And now we've got to the point where that's working fine and they start dumping heavy metals. Yeah. So at that point, which is another three months down the road, so we're now at month kind of, yeah, seven, eight, nine, somewhere around there. This is when we start to think of maybe giving some chelation agents. Yeah. So 
Also, I'm not a fan of chelation. I say, oh, we don't really do chelation. But in this case, we are doing true chelation because we want to capture those metals that are there. So I do want to chelate in that case, yeah. And we can do this with suppositories, so um, calcium EDTA suppositories or DMSA suppositories. Are fine just to capture these, these metals that are coming out. You just have to have in your head that they've done their ACT, a few, and you give them KPU support a few weeks to months down the road, they're not going to feel too good again. It's going to be a dip because of the detox. Yeah. And that's where we need to come in and say, okay, take the KPU, say, let's say for six weeks, and then we'll add calcium EDTA suppositories or DM, DMSA suppositories to catch the heavy metals. Okay. Yeah? So now we're at point nine, not month nine. Yeah, yeah. And then keep them on that for about three months. We're at a year's point after that, yeah. And we think at that time, we kind of, the zinc's done its job, they've dropped the heavy metals, yeah, we've got the neural repair going on, we're scavenging the histamine so they're not getting all these histamine problems and mast cell problems. The Wallerian degeneration, it lasts as long as the repair needs to go on, yeah. So it's not something I can say, okay, in, you know, six months you're going to be fine. It really depends on the extent of damage, yeah. So we have to be prepared to think that some patients, after a year, they're going to be fine. Other patients, and we've seen this, yeah, historically, 18 months, you know, they're, they're starting now suddenly to feel, hey, now things are slowing down, yeah. So we've just got to be prepared for that part. So the histamine scavenger might need to be taken, you know, for a year altogether yeah. and, until you get over that phase, yeah. But physiologically <clears throat> and historically, looking back on our patients, we see they do get through it, but we have to help them through it, yeah. I think the problem we've been seeing this year is just for the patients, it's been simply unbearable. Yeah, they've, they've been feeling sick enough as it is. They get into the system stage and it now gets the unbearable stage. Yeah. And then they've got all the glutamate making them not feel good. The lack of zinc makes you not feel good uh, as well. And that all compounds into just a deadly recipe of, yeah, not being happy and, and yeah, thinking it's a failure, where it's actually a process that you have to get through. So I think with these things, we've, we've got really good things in place now, and we know what's going on, and we know kind of when it happens, um, that we can support the patients uh, through this. Does that make sense? Sounds great. Sounds great. <laughs> uh, okay. No, that's good. So, um, yeah, we're trying to be able to supply the patients with everything, because then there's all the questions. We're giving them zeolite clay as well, the, the clay highlighter um, here. Here is very common, US is not so common, and then there's lots of controversy. Are there heavy metals in the clay or not? Yeah, there's been some where they've analyzed it and seen heavy metals. Um, so basically what we're doing is putting together a package of things that we know is safe. Yeah, so we found the probiotic that we need. We're producing these things we produce ourselves. So in the US, Dr. Kim uh, mixes this here. You'll be mixing this for your patients. Um, so we know this is okay. Sammy, I think is fine. We can, yeah, we can have that. As I said, zeolite clay, we have a source now, and I've, I've ordered it from there. We, we got like 60 pounds uh, coming uh, from that source. It has been analyzed, has certificates, it's fine, free of heavy metals. So this is something we can offer uh, to our patients as well. So basically everything they need, we can put that together now, and we, we have it for them. Yeah, and also the, the calcium EDTA and DMSA suppositories, we can produce those ourselves uh, to give to the patients as well. So I think all in all, we should be fine. But I think the bottom line is when we speak to patients, and we started to say this already, it's a year's process, yeah? But now it's a year's process where we're holding their hand through that year's process, rather than saying, okay, <laughs> hang in there, yeah? Now we can really actively do something because we understand what's, uh, what's going on.